Welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie de Rosier, and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College, this beautiful college, is built on indigenous land, the land of the Huron, one that the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the credit. We acknowledge their stewardship of the land and express our gratitude for the ability that we have to be here and celebrate this week in their Indigenous Heritage Week. Today we'll talk about treaties, the past, the present, and the future of treaties. And I want to thank uh, Mary Eberts, who has helped construct this week of events. Uh, thank you, Mary. It, it's, uh, and you'll see her later on uh, heading this, uh, this uh, session today. I also want to thank the technical team here at Massey College. Thank you very much for helping us uh, deliver this uh, very interesting series this week. Before I pass the mic to uh, Mary, uh, we're going to see a little video that was done by Nathan Tidridge about the Chapel Royale. Chapel Royale is a pretty unique thing that exists at Massey, and we want all of the community to know its origin and what it represents. On National Indigenous Peoples Day, June 21st, 2017, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II bestowed a rare honor on St. Catherine's Chapel at Massey College. The Queen designated it a Chapel Royal in recognition of the unique relationship between Massey College and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. In Anishinaabemowin, the Chapel Royal at Massey College is called Gichitwa Gemakwe. Mississauga Anishinaabek, Anam Amik, the Queen's Anishinaabek Sacred Place, a name created by James Shawana, Anishinaabek language teacher at Lloyd S. King Elementary School in New Credit. Three of the chapels royal located outside the United Kingdom are located in Ontario. Notably, each of these chapels is distinguished by an Indigenous affiliation which demonstrates the direct connection between Indigenous nations and the Crown. The Queen's Chapel Royal near Deseronto and the Chapel Royal in Brantford are associated with the Mohawk Nation. The Chapel Royal at Massey College is the first to be associated with the Anishinaabek Nation. This mural, created by Phil Cote, tells the story of the Treaty of Niagara through an Indigenous voice and provides an introduction to the theme of the Chapel Royal. It illustrates the negotiation process and the nature of Indigenous treaties as living agreements that evolve and change constantly, as do all living things. The Silver Covenant Chain of Friendship Wampum Belt near the base of the mural has Indigenous icons, as well as the date of 1764, which represents the union of Indigenous people and the Crown. The woman on the left is Molly Brandt, the wife of Sir William Johnson, who negotiated the treaty on behalf of King George III, and elder sister of Joseph Brandt. She likely explained to Johnson the importance of wampum in Indigenous treaty negotiation, thereby influencing him to present the Silver Covenant Chain of Friendship wampum belt. She holds a string of wampum beads, which give her permission to speak on the matter. The shells from which wampum beads are made are considered living, even though they have been cut and pierced to make beads. As such, wampum belts are living treaty documents. A turtle tattoo on Molly Brandt's arm represents Turtle Island, the indigenous name for North America. The blue seed carrier bird in the upper left corner represents the heart. The row of indigenous chiefs to the right begins with Chief Pontiac of the Adawa one of the principal organizers of a rebellion in 1763 against the British that led to the formation of a First Nations alliance. He can be identified by the bear robe he is wearing. The robe is distinguished by a bear head. He also carries a talking stick. The row continues with representations of some of the 24 indigenous nations who negotiated the Treaty of Niagara with Sir William Johnson. They include Huron-Wendat, Deer, Antler, and Feather Headdress, Haudenosaunee, Shawnee, wearing a George III gorget on his chest, Sioux Fox, 
Anishinaabek, and Mississauga. Eel feather bonnet with a red falcon on the front. The animals represent different indigenous clans, or dotums. The Mississaugas are members of the eagle dotum. The word Mississauga has two meanings, a place where the mouths of many rivers meet and a place where the eagles meet. The marten near the base of the painting represents the warrior clan. The role of this clan is to protect the indigenous people. In his letter of support for the Chapel Royal, Mississauga Chief Stacy Laforme stated, My people's ancestors were at Niagara when the Silver Covenant Chain of Friendship was extended into these lands over 250 years ago. It is in the spirit of that gathering that this chapel will serve as a place to gather regularly for this and future generations. Confederation set aside our treaty relationships beginning a very dark chapter in the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples on these lands. The establishment of this Chapel Royal, a space to reflect, learn, and reconnect by Her Majesty and the Massey community 150 years later, is a profound act of reconciliation. It will become, in effect, a new council fire for our peoples to gather around in love and friendship. Well, Dave Rosier has said, the land on which Massey College is located has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This meeting place of Toronto is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful for the opportunity to study, learn, and work here. <clears throat> The topic of today's panel is treaties. The Government of Canada states on one of its websites that treaties provide a framework for living together and sharing the land Indigenous peoples traditionally occupied. In fact, treaties entered into by Her Majesty the Queen and Indigenous peoples were documents by which the Indigenous signatories were taken by the Crown to have surrendered, surrendered and yielded their land in return for certain promises and benefits. Whether these treaties were fair, what they mean, whether they did amount to a cession of land, and whether they have been fully and honorably implemented and observed by Canada are key questions in continuing litigation. And whether the treaties established fair and just relationships between Canada and its Indigenous people, and the Indigenous people here uh, may remain to be seen. U of T Professor Emeritus Peter Russell will begin the panel today by describing the historical treaties and treaty process of Canada, a process which ended in 1923 with the signing of the two almost identical Williams Treaties by seven First Nations in Ontario. Lawyer Jada Turan lead counsel to these nations negotiating team following years of litigation to challenge the making and the terms of those treaties will describe for us the path which led to the making of these treaties and how their injustices were discovered and remedies sought. Following the 1973 landmark decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in Calder versus the Attorney General of BC, Canada determined that it would negotiate what it called comprehensive land claims with Indigenous peoples. The modern treaty was born. Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982 assigned constitutional protection to treaties, including the modern treaties. <clears throat> 
Very little of British Columbia was subject to the historic treaties, and thus modern treaty making is an important development for the province. We are honoured to have with us today Chief Commissioner Celeste Haldane, QC, of the BC Treaty Commission to provide an overview of the modern treaty process in BC. Let's begin our uh, presentations uh, with Peter Russell. He is a University Professor Emeritus here at U of T and a Senior Fellow of Massey College. Since the 1970s, he's been deeply involved as a friend and supporter of Indigenous peoples seeking a just relationship with Canada. He was a member of the federal government's task force on comprehensive land claims and chaired the research advisory committee for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Peter? Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Well, treaties with Indigenous peoples are agreements between sovereign peoples on how to share country in a just and mutually beneficial manner. Their use by Indigenous peoples predates contact with Europeans. Indian nations and confederations of Indian nations often use treaties to establish peaceful relations and settle disputes. Regulating relations between Indigenous peoples and the states within which they find themselves embedded by anything other than consensual agreements, or uh, that is treaties, will entail a continuation of the state's effort to colonize Indigenous lands and peoples and treat Indigenous peoples as racially inferior to the non-Indigenous majority. Treaties are <coughs> the only way to govern relations between Indigenous people and Canada. In the Canadian territory, the French colonists in Champlain's era made very little use of treaties because they aimed to intermarry with Indigenous peoples and create a new North American civilization. But the British, after defeating New France militarily, uh, followed the Dutch practice and used treaties with Indigenous people to maintain peaceful and respectful relations with them. Uh, the Treaty of Niagara, which you saw in the presentation on uh, the chapel royal here, the Treaty of Ni Niagara, negotiated by William Johnson in 1764 uh, with sachems and chiefs of 24 Indigenous nations, recognized the political independence of Indigenous nations and committed the parties to sharing the country in respectful and mutually beneficial ways. Uh, in a book I've written called Canada's Odyssey, I call this our first confederation. Now in Upper and Lower Canada, and later the United Colony of Canada, the colonists, governments, used treaties to secure land for settlers and industry. But the treaty process was flawed. For the non-Indigenous side, a treaty was a once and for all deal in which the non-Indigenous gained ownership of the land and in return granted the Indigenous people certain benefits, including money and small parcels of land where they could be left alone. The policy aim was gradual civilization, whereby male heads of indigenous families who were deemed to be civilized <coughs> could remove their family and their parcel of land from the reserve and in effect disappear as a distinct people by blending into the dominant mainstream society. That was the non-Indigenous view. The Indigenous people, on the other hand, saw treaties as initiating an ongoing process of peaceful coexistence uh, <coughs> as they and the newcomers constantly work out 
the best way to share the country. On the ground, it was the colonist version of treaties that prevailed, as indigenous people decimated by disease caused by exposure to infections for which their immune system were unprepared, makes us think of the COVID-19 <laughs> situation we're in. They were in that situation, a uh, similar situation. It was the nadir of their power. It was the lowest uh, their power <coughs> uh, had fallen to uh, in resisting white man encroachment on their lands. Not surprising then, at the time of Confederation, in 1867, treaties with Native peoples are not mentioned in the British North America Act that established the Canadian Federation. The only reference to Indigenous peoples is in the list of the new federal government's powers, where Indians and lands reserved for them are subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of Canada's Parliament, the Canadian Parliament. After Confederation, the new Dominion of Canada had its first big major project was to acquire the lands in the prairies and in the north, where the population was predominantly Indigenous and Métis. Between 1871 and 1921, the Canadian government used treaties, 11 of them, uh, to acquire indigenous lands uh, <coughs> for European and American white settlers uh, and resource industries. Now, there's an upside to those treaties. Uh, the upside of the so-called numbered treaties was that by negotiating them, Canada recognized that the land and resources were owned by indigenous peoples. The downside was that the negotiating process was fraudulent, was a fraud. The treaties were printed in Ottawa in English only before the negotiations, and they all contained what I have called the killer clause, in which the indigenous sing signatories are purported to, and these are, this is a quote, to cede, release, surrender, and yield up all of their rights whatsoever. Yeah, the colonial, colonist lawyers really wanted to nail that one down. <laughs> cede, release, surrender, and yield up. What, what actually happened at the ceremonies where representatives of indigenous nations uh, met with representatives of the Crown, is that the Crown's negotiators never mentioned that clause, quiet about that, silent <laughs> about it. And in very elaborate ceremonies, <clears throat> assured the indigenous people present that they would enjoy their lands as long as the sun rises and the rivers flow. Negotiating treaties with indigenous peoples was revived by Pierre Elliott Trudeau in the 1970s, after indigenous peoples rejected his, his government's plan to extend to them all the rights and benefits enjoyed by all Canadians on condition, one condition, that they abandon their indigenous identities. Trudeau's policy change was triggered by the Supreme Court of Canada decision in 1973, the Calder case, which has already been mentioned. The Calder case recognized that the Nisca people of the Nass Valley in British Columbia owned their land, but the court split on whether or not their ownership, their aboriginal title, had been extinguished. Now the aim of treaty making, the so-called Comprehensive Land Claims Agreement, was to secure the agreement of the indigenous owners to the extinguishment of their title in return for certain benefits, including money and a limited voice in the management 
of their traditional lands. Such agreements, and by the way, uh, at this point, in the 70s, the federal government would not call the agreements treaties. Uh, there's a, b a bit of rhetorical gamesmanship there. They would only call them land claims, comprehensive land claim agreements, not treaties. Treaties was to give too much weight to them. The negotiating parties for the very first land claims agreement, the 1975 James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, were the governments of Canada and Quebec. The Grand Council of the Cree of Quebec and the Quebec Inuit Association. The main purpose of the agreement was to remove any legal doubts about the Great Whale Hydroelectric Project, the industrial flagship of Quebec's Quiet Revolution, which had been planned without any consultation with the native owners of over a million square miles of lands and waters owned by the Cree and Inuit peoples. Most Im indigenous peoples who had not made treaty with the Crown and were still on their traditional lands refused to participate in land claims negotiation. This was the position of most First Nations in British Columbia, the one province that had always refused to recognize Aboriginal title. In 1982, Treaties with Indigenous Peoples finally, finally were mentioned in Canada's written constitution. The Constitution Act 1982 is known mainly for fa facilitating the patriation of Canada's constitution by making it possible to amend the constitution entirely in Canada and for adding the Charter <coughs> of Rights and Freedoms. But it contains a section 35 on the rights of Aboriginal peoples. <coughs> Section 45 was forced into the patriation process by televised demonstrations in Indigenous protesters on Capitol Hill in Ottawa. Section 35 recognizes and affirms, I'll say that again, recognizes and affirms, and then I quote, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, end of quote. And it defines these people as including, quote, the Indian, Inuit, and Métis peoples of Canada, end of quote. After four attempts in the 1980s to secure an agreement between representatives of Indigenous people and non-Indigenous governments that would clarify what existing Aboriginal and treaty rights are, the Supreme Court of Canada in the 1990 Sparrow case ruled that those rights were not subject to restrictions imposed in the past by regulations of the colonial state. But the court also ruled uh, that Aboriginal rights, the court ruled, could be, wait for it, justifiably infringed <laughs> by non-Indigenous governments. And also said that the lands that Aboriginal rights protect uh, on those lands, only traditional academic, uh, economic uh, activities uh, could, could go on. In that same year, in 1990, the Supreme Court in another case called Sui ruled that in interpreting treaties, <coughs> it is necessary to go beyond the written text and find the common understanding of the indigenous and non-indigenous parties. After 1990, events outside the courts have led the process of reforming relations with Indigenous people. First, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, 1991-1996, with four Aboriginal and three non-Aboriginal commissioners, uh, reviewed past relations with Indigenous people in Canada, analyzed the situation that then prevailed, and considered how the relationship will be reformed in the future. In a nutshell, RCAP called for people-to-people, nation-to-nation relations, uh, relationships of indigenous peoples with Canada and spelled out a host of actions that should be taken to achieve that kind of relationship with First Nations, the Inuit, and the Métis Nation. <coughs> 
The other developments were the 2008 parliamentary apology to indigenous people, which led to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and its 94 calls for action, and finally the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, agreed to conditionally by Canada in 2011 and unconditionally in 2016. Now, the key result of all these, these developments is acceptance by non-Indigenous governing elites of the political independence of First Nations, the Inuit peoples, and the Métis Nation, and their non-subordination, their non-subordination to federal, provincial, and territorial governments. Though Canada internationally is recognized as a single sovereign state, its governing powers are shared between national, provincial, and indigenous governments. The only way to resolve differences peacefully between these equally sovereign authorities is through consensual agreements or treaties. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter, for a comprehensive and yet uh, very compact history of the uh, making and the uh, injustices incorporated into uh, the treaty process in Canada. We're going to have a spotlight on one of those injustices offered by Jada Turan. Uh, she was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey, and arrived in Canada in 2002 to attend McGill University. There she earned an undergraduate degree in political science and international development. She later earned a Master of Science degree from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. In 2012, she earned her common law and civil law degrees from McGill University and was called to the Ontario Bar in 2013. After practicing as a sole practitioner uh, for a while, Jada joined the Montreal-based Aboriginal law firm Hutchins Legal in 2015 to work on the Alderville et al. versus Her Majesty the Queen litigation, a large complex action before the federal court regarding a long-standing dispute over the 1923 uh, Williams Treaties. She was involved in all aspects of the litigation and was later appointed by the First Nations as the lead counsel to the negotiating team that resulted in a historic settlement for the Williams Treaties First Nations. She has since opened her own firm, Turan Law Office, committed to defending and advancing First Nations Aboriginal and treaty rights and assisting her clients advance their laws, governance, and economic interests. Uh, Jada is the inaugural recipient of the Toronto Lawyers, Lawyers Association's Emerging Excellence Award. Jada? Um, thank you, Peter, um, for your wonderful presentation, and thank you, Mary, for inviting me here today um, to discuss the Women's Treaties First Nations 170 years long history for justice. I apologize in advance to the First Nations since I have a really short time dedicated to this presentation. Um, so I don't think I'll be able to do justice to your perseverance and fight for your rights um, over this short period of time. I'd like to start by introducing the Williams Treaties First Nations. The Williams Treaties First Nations are comprised of three Chippewa and four Mississauga First Nations. The Mississaugas of Alderville First Nation, Curve Lake First Nation, Hiawatha First Nation, and the Mississaugas of Schoolog Island First Nation are the First Nation signatories to the 1923 Williams Treaties between the Mississaugas and Canada. That is one of the 1923 Williams Treaties. The, um, the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation, Bosa Lake First Nation, and Rama First Nations are the First Nations signatories to the 1923 treaty between the Chippewas and Canada, also generally referred to as one of the two Williams Treaties of that year. The text of the two Williams Treaties is almost identical except for the details necessary to identify the particular signatories. It's important to note that prior to the conclusion of the Williams Treaties, all of the seven Williams Treaty First Nations had entered into peace and friendship, coexistence and military alliance treaties with the Crown. 
Now, the Williams Treaties of 1923 purported to take a surrender of all the rights, title, interests, claims, demands, and privileges whatsoever into, upon, or in respect of the lands and premises of the Williams First Treaties First Nations described in the three clauses of the Williams Treaties, except for the reserves that had already been set aside um, for the First Nations previously. These lands covered an area of land between the Georgian Bay um, on the west to the Ottawa River on the east, all the way from uh, Lake Nipissing and French River um, down to uh, the northern shore, of, northern shore of Lake Ontario. What was unique about the Williams Treaties, and not in a good way, was unlike the majority of the pre-Confederation treaties the First Nations had concluded with the Crown, all post-Confederation number treaties that Peter referred to, the 11 um, post-Confederation number treaties, and modern treaties that follow the Williams Treaties. The Williams Treaties failed to set aside reserve lands for the signatory First Nations, and it did not protect the First Nations' rights to hunt, fish, trap, and gather in their territories. Furthermore, after the conclusion of the Williams Treaties, and until 2012, Canada and Ontario argued that the Williams Treaties took a surrender of the First Nations' previous treaty harvesting rights to hunt, fish, trap, and gather. So the treaties that had guaranteed their rights to hunt, fish, trap, and gather previous to the, um, prior to the Williams Treaty's conclusion, the Crown argued that all of those um, rights were surrendered in um, the Williams Treaties. In fact, in 1994, the Supreme Court of Canada, in the unfortunate judgment of R versus Howard, agreed with Canada that the Williams Treaties had taken a surrender of Hiawatha First Nations pre-Confederation treaty harvesting rights, which was interpreted by Canada to apply to all seven Williams Treaty First Nations. Now let's look at the period before the signing of the treaties. During the period from 1847 to 1915, on numerous occasions, the Williams Treaty First Nations petitioned the British and later the Federal Crown explaining that their northern hunting grounds, which is the area of land that's covered by Clause 1 of the Williams Treaties, were being encroached upon by settlers and had never been surrendered um, to the Crown. Um, the petition and correspondence from the First Nations demonstrate that at least as early as 1847, the Dominion had notice of the Williams Treaty First Nations' assertions of ownership of their northern hunting grounds. The First Nations requested both monetary compensation and reserves um, and protection of their harvesting rights from settlement encroachment um, in exchange for um, treating for their northern hunting grounds. The Crown's correspondence and conduct demonstrate that it allowed the settlement and encroachment of the First Nations northern hunting grounds without treating for those lands for more than 75 years. Um, if you look at the survey dates for all the townships in Ontario, it clearly demonstrates that the vast majority of the northern hunting grounds were surveyed after Canada's recognition that these lands were never surrendered and notification to Ontario of this information, but before the signing of the Williams Treaties. One poignant example is derived from an 1859 petition from the Chippewas of Lake Huron and, Sim and Simcoe, so the ancestors of the Chippewas of um, Georgina Island, Beausole um, First Nation, and Rama First Nation, stating that their land had been improperly included in the Robinson Huron Treaty um, with a request for a reserve for the future settlement of their First Nations on unsurrendered land northeast of Lake Muskoka. The Federal Crown not only failed to respond to the First Nations claim, but also allowed for all of that land in the area specified by the um, First Nations that had not already been surveyed when the petition was written to be surveyed and encroached upon, including the area that the First Nations had specifically requested as set aside as a reserve without their consent and without compensation. From 1850 to 1880, all of the northern hunting grounds were surveyed entirely despite the First Nations' repeated claims that these lands had not been treated for. Um, by the beginning of the new century, encroachment upon the Williams Treaty First Nations land had made the exercise of their rights exceedingly difficult, if not possible. When they wanted to retain a lawyer to advance their claim and wanted to use the trust funds, their trust funds that were held by Canada, 
The Department of Indian Affairs refused to disband the funds and told the First Nations that they did not need um, outside legal advice. Fast forward to 1923, so this is 75 years after the first petition from Alderville First Nation that their lands were being encroached, encroached upon without a treaty, Canada and Ontario entered into an agreement to appoint a commission <coughs> to, um, first of all, uh, have an inquiry into the validity of the claim, and if the claim was determined to be valid, to negotiate a treaty with the Williams Treaty First Nation. So upon the execution of this memorandum of agreement between Canada and Ontario and the formation of the commission, the commission travels to the Williams Treaty First Nations Reserves and gathers evidence to validate their claim. And here's testimony from 75, uh, a total of 75 witnesses. The testimony at the hearings which were transcribed pri provide evidence of the First Nations use and occupation of the lands that would eventually be subject to the Williams Treaties. Based on this testimony evidence submitted to the commissioners and the commissioners' archival research, the commission concluded that the Williams Treaty First Nations had established their use and occupation of their northern hunting grounds, which is clause one of the Williams Treaties. Now, during the inquiry, both the Chippewa and the Mississauga witnesses also informed the commissioners that their western hunting grounds, which um, are townships um, south of Lake Simcoe, had been uh, reserved in a previous treaty, but there was encroachment on those lands. They also informed the commissioners that they retained their harvesting rights under their pre-confederation treaties and were unable to exercise those rights because of interference from settlers. They also repeated their request for reserves as they had done throughout the history of their claim. It's important to note that the commissioners repeated the, repeatedly tell the Williams Treaty First Nations that they were only there to take evidence respecting their northern hunting grounds and that they did not have a mandate to set aside reserve lands even though they were aware of their mandate to set aside reserves as per the memorandum of agreement that had been signed between Canada and Ontario. Now when the commissioners conduct their own research, they conclude that in addition to the northern hunting grounds, the western hunting grounds um, had also not been surrendered. And in their estimate, a moderate estimate of the value of the townships will be $30 million in 1923. However, the commissioners do not inform the Williams Street First Nations of their assessment of the value of the townships or that these lands would be included in the Williams Treaties. Remember, they con consistently told the First Nations that they were only there to take a surrender of their northern hunting grounds. Further, the commissioners report to Canada that they made deliberate efforts to disabuse the Williams Street First Nations of their understanding of the nature of their interest in their lands and the value of their lands. Um, the Williams Treaty First Nations, the commissioners report, were asking for um, upwards of $10 million for compensation. Um, the commissioners also compare um, what in their assessments um, would be required to compensate the Williams Treaty First Nation based on contemporaneous treaties um, like Robinson Huron Treaty and Treaty 9. So they decide that if it was, uh, they determined that if the Williams Treaty First Nations were to be compensated based on the Robinson Huron Treaty, it would be $840,000 plus 156,000 um, acres of reserve lands. And if it was uh, based on Treaty 9, it would be one po around $1.4 million plus 320,000 acres of reserve land. However, Ontario had set a ceiling of $500,000 and it seems like commissioners agreed to Ontario's demand that only $500,000 be paid. Um, now, the Williams Treaty First Nations conduct post-1923, the statement made afterwards by the signatories, newspaper articles, and documentation in the years following the treaties demonstrate that the First Nations signatories understood that setting aside of reserves and protection of harvesting rights were terms of the Williams Treaties. Um, so I will just want to quote from um, an, an article published in the Barrie Northern Advance in 1923, which discusses a letter from Chief Bigwin, uh, who was a signatory chief to the Chippewa Treaty, stating <coughs> that the Gansha Treaty, which falls within um, close two of the Williams Treaties, was not supposed to be impacted by 1923. He, uh, chief Bigwin states, and I quote, before signing the treaty, each commissioner got up and said these wary words, that the Indians would still be able to hunt, fish, and trap. Restrictions on fishing weren't to be included in the treaty. 
and Chief Bigwin quotes, we don't want the fish or game, end quote. And then he says, the commissioner said, build wigwams on the river banks and hunt free without license. As long as the grass grows and water runs, you shall be free and pay no license forever. Numerous other examples show that the First Nations continued to hold the belief that they retained their hunting and fishing rights. However, they were prosecuted or um, threatened with prosecution for attempting to exercise their rights to hunt, fish, and trap and gather, which not only threatened their physical survival as a people, but their cultural, spiritual, and social survival as well. One such example is the Taylor and Williams case of 1981. In that case, Wayne Taylor and, then, uh, and uh, the then chief Doug Williams, members of Kerr Lake First Nation, were charged and convicted for catching bullfrogs out of season. They were later acquitted when the Court of Appeal recognized that Treaty 20 of 1818 had provided for hunting and fishing rights. However, four years later in 1985, when George Howard, a member of Hiawatha First Nation, was fined after having been convicted for fishing out of season, the Crown argues that the Williams Treaties of 1923 had taken a surrender of pre-Confederation Treaty harvesting rights. And um, the Supreme Court, as I mentioned earlier, agreed with the Crown's um, interpretation of the Williams Treaties. George Howard, a member of um, the Hiawatha First Nation, brought, brought his claim before um, the United Nations Human Rights Commission as well and stated, hunting, fishing, gathering, and trapping are essential components of my culture, and that denial of the ability to exercise it imperils transmission of the culture to other persons and later to, um, gen to later generations. Um, so, the Williams <coughs> Treaties of First Nations initiate pr proceedings in the federal court in 1992 against Canada for the losses flowing from the breaches of the honor of the crown and fiduciary duties in the making terms implementation of the Williams Treaties. And then um, Canada later um, joins Ontario as a third party, seeking uh, co not only compensation for their losses result resulting um, from um, the Crown's failure to uphold um, the honor of the Crown and breaches um, of its fiduciary duties, but also um, seeking protection for their pre-Confederation Treaty harvesting rights. Um, the proceedings are held in abeyance um, between 1992 and 1995 and then from 2009 to 2010 to allow for negotiations which are not successful. And then in 2012, so um, 20 years <coughs> after the proceedings were initiated, the evidence, <coughs> the hearing of the evidence uh, begins in the federal court, which was completed in 2017. So after five years of evidence being heard, the proceedings um, were adjourned on consent of all the parties to enter into negotiations. And after a, um, half, uh, after a year and a half of intense negotiations, the parties were able to reach a negotiated settlement agreement. And I'll conclude my uh, present presentation at this point, but I just want to say that it's important to note that the First Nation negotiators who brought home the settlement agreement, which included um, the recognition of the First Nations harvesting rights and a financial compensation of uh, 1.11 billion dollars and entitlement to add the reserves and an apology were members of the Williams Reed First Nations themselves. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a sad tale of neglect and deception and fraud on the part of Canada and a wonderful tale of the determination of the First Peoples uh, who kept their uh, dreams, who kept their claims and their hopes alive from at least 1847 to the modern day, over 150 years, and then finally succeeded in uh, getting uh, redress. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a unique story, uh, and uh, it is one that uh, s tribunals like the Specific Claims Tribunal and processes like the Treaty Land Entitlement Process out west have been uh, hard pressed to deal with over the years. Now we're going to hear from Celeste Haldane, who is the Chief Commissioner of the BC uh, Treaty Commission. She was appointed to her second term as Chief Commissioner in April 2020. She had previously served as an elected uh, Commissioner uh, starting in 2011. She's a practicing lawyer and was appointed QC in 2019. 
She holds a Master of Laws in Constitutional Law from Osgoode Hall Law School and a Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor of Arts from UBC. In 2015, she began her doctorate in Anthropology and Law at UBC. Celeste has been appointed to a number of uh, positions by the provincial government, including the Chair of the Legal Services Society, or Legal Aid, and she has recently completed six years on the UBC Board of Governors. She continues to serve on the UBC Indigenous Engagement Committee as the past chair. She is the director of the Brain Canada Foundation and the Musqueam Capital Corporation. She's an active member of both the Canadian Bar Association and the Indigenous Bar Association and an alumna of the Governor General's Canadian Leadership Conference. She is a member of the Sparrow family from Musqueam and is Timchin through Metlakatla. She is the proud mother of three and grandmother of two. Celeste? Grandma. Thank you Thank very, you very much. much, and uh, I play also. Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm joining you from Vancouver, or the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. I'm deeply grateful to have uh, been asked, and so thank you, Mary, as well as Massey College, for incorporating um, some of the modern treaty perspective with, uh, with enhancing this panel. Um, I'm going to move through the slides, so we'll go, um, I think we're starting on the first slide, so we'll move to the next slide. So um, we'll move to the next slide. I just thought I would share briefly um, the BC Treaty Commission's role and mandate, which is uh, we're the only legally established tripartite body in Canada whose mandate is to support reconciliation. And we have a three-part mandate, which is facilitation, uh, funding allocation, so our, uh, the Treaty Commission here in BC funds the First Nations of the treaty tables in the negotiations process, as well as our mandate um, is to engage in public education and public awareness with regards to uh, reconciliation in BC, as well as treaty negotiations. Our mandate has been expanded uh, as of 2018, which looks to um, the protection of Indigenous title and rights, as well as the implementation of the UN Declaration through modern treaty. So that's a big part of our, our role is facilitation. Um, we also, when called upon, facilitate nation-to-nation -nation, um, discussions, which could result in protocols being developed and going back to, I would say, our, old, our own Indigenous ways of problem solving when it comes to shared territory. Next slide, please. So modern treaties across Canada, when we're uh, referring to modern treaties, um, they're negotiated post-1973, of course, following uh, the landmark Calder case. And I do have to acknowledge the uh, NISCA and their pursuit of justice when it came to their lands, resources, title, and the ability to practice their culture, their hunting rights, their fishing rights within their uh, territory. Um, I just wanted to highlight the first modern treaty, which was already discussed, the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement in 1975. And then since then, 29 additional treaties uh, referred to as modern treaties or comprehensive land claims. I personally don't like the notion of land claims. It seems as though as an Indigenous person, we're claiming something back that we rightfully own. Um, but again, that's where treaty negotiations as well as uh, negotiations of agreements and other constructive arrangements comes in. So we can build our relationship together and move forward uh, together in the province of British Columbia, but more importantly, um, in, across the country. Eight of these modern treaties are within British Columbia, and I'll move to the next slide, which is just a map capturing um, sort of where we are in this negotiation stage here in British Columbia, as well as what it looks like across the country uh, when it comes to modern treaties. I'll move to the next slide. Uh, modern treaties in British Columbia. So as we heard, uh, Niska Nation was negotiated just prior to the Treaty Commission um, getting our mandate and getting up and running um, when it comes to uh, modern treaties in BC, they are tripartite, which means uh, 
Canada, British Columbia, and the First Nations are engaged in negotiations, and that's just as a result of um, the Constitution and how it's constructed after Confederation. So you have Section 92 that the province holds uh, responsibilities for, and then you have Section 9124, which the federal government holds responsibilities for. And then, of course, the Indigenous nation uh, negotiating a modern treaty also has their own responsibilities, laws, um, protocols, and as well as uh, deep interest in their their treaty settlement lands and their traditional territory, as well as a role off their traditional territory. So again, looking at their role and their ability to access resources, whether it be forestry resources, fisheries resources, or hunting in their total traditional territory, not just on their treaty settlement lands. Um, this just provides an overview with regards to um, the transfer of ownership and jurisdiction when it comes to each nation. So, for instance, Tawasa Nation um, received 724 hectares of land in a one-time capital transfer payment of $13.9 million over 10 years. Um, they also negotiated some mineral rights or the relinquishing of those um, to start up transition costs. And I just wanted to provide a bit of a snapshot when it comes to what these modern treaties look like what the capital transfer is, i.e. the cash component, um, and uh, what their land jurisdiction looks like. Manus actually comprises five First Nations on the west coast of British Columbia. So you have Huwait, Kayukit, Chekalset, Toquat, Uchukalset, and Ukulip. They negotiated together as a, um, uh, coming together as five nations. However, each of their treaties is individual and independent. And it recognizes the transfer of ownership of 24,000 plus hectares of land, as well as their one-time capital transfer of 73.1 million. And they also ensure that there is resources provided annually to ensure that um, their governance and their governments are being funded. Tulliamon is another uh, nation that's located on um, sort of in the sort of lower coast of British Columbia, but it, uh, again, I just wanted to highlight sort of what the economic transfer was, as well as the um, hectares of lands that were transferred. But again, that's just looking at the, the raw crux of it, the land and cash component. There's a lot more uh, that goes into a modern treaty, i.e. spelling out whose jurisdiction is um, going to play out when it comes to laws, when it comes to um, there are certain instances where the First Nations or the Indigenous Nations laws uh, prevail when it comes to a conflict over Canada and BC. I'll move to the next slide, please. And really, this is the one of the most important um, elements of modern treaties, and I would say treaties in general, is the actual sharing of sovereignty. And in British Columbia, modern treaties are the highest form of reconciliation. And they are a constitutionally protected form of sharing of sovereignty. I truly believe that true self-determination and self-government for Indigenous peoples cannot happen without the sharing of jurisdiction. And that is a key message from uh, a legal opinion that I received from the late Peter Hogg. And we just wanted to ensure that when we're looking at what the sharing of sovereignty looks like and the sharing of jurisdiction, it's not just around uh, laws and policies, it's around the true economic sharing of resources. And as the Supreme Court of Canada held in Delgamook, if we look about the inescapable economic component of tidal land, that needs to be translated to the Indigenous nation through um, economic ability it must include the true sharing of lands, resources, and for the longest time, I would say Indigenous nations across the country, but primarily in, in British Columbia, where we don't have a lot of modern treaties, Indigenous nations were seeing uh, lands and resources being taken up or resources being taken out of their territory without having any uh, ability to um, reap the economic rewards. And that changes now when we have the sharing of sovereignty through modern treaty. I'll move to the next slide, please. 
I just wanted to uh, highlight where I think we are in British Columbia and um, the notion of seed release surrender and yield up has been a long-standing issue and sort of a, 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 um, a been a contentious issue for Indigenous people because, as we would say, we've never given up, nor would we ever agree to extinguishment. And in British Columbia, in the modern treaty process, we've moved beyond that, where um, the burdens of extinguishment are no more, as well as the treaty loan debt is gone, because I is um, we're in a recognition of rights process, which means in a recognition of rights process, there should be no extinguishment, seed release, surrender. It's about building a mutually beneficial, respectful relationship, a treaty that's going to evolve, a treaty that must evolve to ensure that we meet the um, individual and the collective rights of the Indigenous nation, but as well as ensuring that we're adjusting to what's happening uh, in Canada, British Columbia, as well as the uh, global situation. And as we all are aware, we are pretty in some pretty interesting times when it comes to uh, having to navigate a pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, so I've already mentioned our expanded mandate. I just touch high, I'll highlight a little bit on our contribution funding moving forward. And uh, as most know, before when the process was set up, there was 80% loan funding and 20% uh, grant funding that went to First Nations in the treaty negotiations process. And this was just another uh, additional burden from the comprehensive claims policy and the mindset that was set up at that time um, where nations would be burdened with a, a large amount of debt uh, when they had concluded their treaty negotiations. And for those that never concluded a treaty, for whatever reason, perhaps they're pursuing a different self, uh, different pathway to self-determination, uh, would end up having this loan on their books as an outstanding debt and a receivable for Canada. That changes of last year where uh, the federal government committed in their budget to um, repay and wipe out 1.1 billion of loans that were sitting on modern treaty negotiating uh, tables across Canada. And I think that's a real testament to um, the advancement of reconciliation. It's a huge investment in communities. And again, in a re rights recognition process, First Nations or treaty tables should never be burdened with having to take out loans to then negotiate with two crowns on uh, their over their lands and resources that are justifiably theirs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, modern treaties, legislation, and reconciliation. So in British Columbia, we have the first Declaration Act on the rights of Indigenous peoples. We're in our first year of implementing. And so for me, that's a framework to set out how we can continue to evolve our relationship uh, and implement the UN Declaration. But as uh, modern treaties are the implementation of the Declaration, they operationalize the declaration, as well as the operationalized FPIC. Next slide. I just wanted to highlight some of the uh, modern treaties agreements and other constructive arrangements, and in drawing on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I think it's really important to ensure that uh, these principles are respected, as well as that the UN Declaration is uh, implemented through modern treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements. And we're seeing some of that work come to fruition uh, in British Columbia, but more importantly, I noticed that some of that work is coming to fruition in uh, Toronto and in Ottawa, or in Ontario, pardon me. I'll move to the next slide to provide a bit of a synopsis as to perhaps some of the uh, interesting agreements and arrangements that uh, modern treaties can bring. Um, looking at, you know, fire brigade or uh, the servicing and the shared partnership between municipalities and uh, First Nations. I'll move to the next slide. As well as uh, what treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements can look like in Ontario. And I know that there's mainly historic treaties uh, in uh, the region, but there's also 30 um, I would say um, negotiations. Again, I move away from the whole notion of land claims, 
um, related. Some are tripartite in nature and some are bilateral with the federal government. And I think a really interesting uh, development is the Rouge National Urban Park. I think that's a great way for um, you know, reclaiming some space in an urban center and having my community that is located in an urban center, it can be sometimes difficult to uh, reclaim space, but also create those partnerships, like for instance, with um, Parks Canada, as we know over uh, decades, there have been some contentious issues around development and park interests. Um, so I think that's a really great testament to what these other constructive arrangements can look like. Next slide, please. And that's it. So stay connected. And that's me. And I really do appreciate the ability to share some information, uh, some insights uh, with regards to modern treaties in British Columbia. And again, Heights Up Desk, thank you for the kind and generous invitation. Well, Celeste, thank you very much for your presentation. It seems that uh, some of the hopes and some of the beliefs of the First Nations who signed the treaties in the original process of shared sovereignty and a decent uh, constructive relationship uh, between First Nations and the Crown may finally be coming to fruition uh, under the modern treaty process. And we're very grateful to you for outlining some of the highlights of that process as it operates in BC. We don't have any time for questions from the uh, viewers today because our panel, our program has been uh, very um, sort of dense with information and we've taken up our time. But we're very grateful to everyone who has watched and hope that this will provide for you a very good beginning on understanding and appreciating one of the most important aspects of reconciliation in Canada, the treaties.